Hello, everybody. Uh, you are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. And um, yeah, I suppose uh, we're back. It's um, It's been a while. Um, we, we uh, As we announced in um, our kind of one-year anniversary special, uh, we are going to be releasing um, episodes less regularly from here on out because uh, Partly because we, we want to work on other things, but uh, some of those other things uh, have to do with the show. So yeah, you uh, you're not uh, getting rid of us yet. Um, and um, as we also uh, mentioned, uh, we will still be doing these monthly news episodes. So here's this month's. Um, we are certainly excited to um, get started. Um, but uh, before we jump into the stories, um, how have you been doing uh, across these uh, past couple of weeks? I've been doing fairly well. Yeah, as Albert said, we've been we've been working on other projects as well as um, you know working things that are involved with the show. Of course, since we made the announcement on our anniversary special, we are working on the website now. And oh, uh, I am so excited to share this with all of you. It is it's been super fun, and it's kind of like me going back through all the notes and research and books that I had used when preparing humanity a prologue because of course we have the, the the two shows we'll be talking about on the website you know the, the extensive notes and whatnot mm -hmm. um and like going back and, and fleshing out things and returning to all those episodes and seeing what like what has you know remained you know fairly accurate and what needs to be updated a bit and honestly the more i've been doing it the more i realize oh wow there's actually a lot here that i need to tweak mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally fair. Um, I think it's safe to say that the amount of time that we had to like prepare our episodes versus now where we're kind of, uh, we have a little bit more room to like expand on certain things. Right. You realize that, you know, the, the, the detail and the quality of the content changes to an extent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, all in all, like it's, it's going really well. And I think this will be a really wonderful resource for everyone. Um, but otherwise, you know, th things have been fairly good on my end. Um, my birthday is coming up. I'm very excited about that. Um, I'll be turning 27. Mm. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, just been keeping up with, you know, pop culture things. The house is coming together. Um, I know I've thrown little tidbits here and there throughout this entire, um, the entire show's run about the, the property that my folks had got. And uh, now we're slowly building up you know, the foundations to build a house on there. And, oh, mm. it's been amazing. I am just, like, overjoyed at how many different kinds of plants and animals that we have there. Oh, Species yeah. that are native to the region, but I just have never seen in the wild before. Wow. Um, and it's just amazing. Uh, uh, there's the American beauty berry, which is an interesting species. It's the mosquito repellent, kind of like citronella. Mm. Um but the berries grow like around the stems rather than at the ends of like mm -hmm. leaves and flowers, which is something I'd never seen before mm -hmm. in a berry. Um, and like just so many kinds of amphibians, like different kinds of frogs, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of birds. We have two owls oh, wow. of, of unidentified species that we hear them like mm -hmm. in the middle of the day uh, around two or three ish like we'll hear like a ring, like hmm. way in the distance and we know those two because they keep coming from different locations um my folks have gotten more views of them than i have and i they they're convinced that it's a great horned owl hmm. but i definitely like to like take a closer look and be sure yeah um, because I, I this sounds weird but i think the screeching sounds different yeah from like the great horned owl so it might be might be a barred owl um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah they're pretty sure it's not a barn owl, so mm, right. I eliminate that, and it gives, it gives me a few options to like look into. But uh, we will see. And of course, footprints everywhere. So we have like the padding that's all laid out, and it's all like a, a sandy clay mix. And every so often, like in between rainstorms, you just get footprints upon footprints of white-tailed deer crossing through. And we have all all different ages. Um, I can see like the big footprints and the little baby footprints, <laughs> which is super cute. Mm. Um, and we definitely have a fox of some sort. Hmm. That's probably like the biggest like surprise for all of us that we have a little, a, a little canid running around. Um, you know, could be a red fox, could be a gray fox. I'm leaning towards gray fox because I've seen those more around here. But you never know. Hmm. Um, but we're definitely sure it's a fox because 
so uh, a bunch of the neighbors have dogs they kind of let let loose mm. and uh, we've gotten to know very well and they're, they're sweethearts there's one goose he's a, an aussie border collie mix who oh he's just a delight loves to play fetch with us um but his feet are like huge when he leaves footprints mm-hmm. and so that compared to like the little prints like i'm fairly certain like that's not like a, a, one of the neighbor's dogs it's definitely a, some sort of wild wild canid mm-hmm. um and you know we got coyotes and we got foxes so <laughs> it's probably a fox you mm-hmm. know that, that's don't really have a lot of options there right um but yeah things have just been going super well and uh what about on your end buddy um, yeah, so um, I haven't been working too much on my half of the website just yet. Um, so mostly I've been focusing on um, writing my thesis or trying to write my thesis because uh, mm-hmm. writer's block happens. But um, yeah, I, I'm supposed to finish that soon-ish. Um, like, supposedly, if uh, if we were living in normal times, like I... I should be turning my thesis in at the end of this month, but um, because of the pandemic, my university has actually um, given um, all us PhD students uh, extensions um, for another Ooh. three months. So um, we actually have uh, now a lot more time to get our uh, theses done. Um, but even so, um, because I had already been working quite a bit on the thesis, like, you know, even before this point, um, I, I can already see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I, I do want to kind of get it done um, as soon as possible, um, even uh, even though I do have that uh, three month kind of buffer um, now. So, um, yeah, I, I've been I've been I've been trying to trying to wrap that up um, and uh, it's going, I guess. <laughs> um, I think I think maybe optimistically another two weeks I could finish um like the actual writing part of it and then I'll probably send it off to my supervisor for comments and uh, then after that we'll we'll see about like actually um having what we call a leviva which is where I get grilled by a couple of um uh, yeah uh committee members uh, who uh, who will read through my thesis and you know question me about what I did and, and such um but but yeah that, that that's still a little ways off but uh, yeah I can I can see it approaching um so that, that's my that's been my main task over the, the past couple of weeks. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, I, I've also kind of moved uh, recently. Um, so uh, during the time that we were off um, in, in these couple of weeks, uh, I moved to a, a new apartment because um, basically my, uh, uh, I guess, con- contract with the previous one I was living at was, was running out. And so I decided to find a new place. And uh, yeah, it, it's actually quite nice. Um, the, the move itself, uh, it 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 was relatively easy to do because it, it's pretty close to where I live. I, I'm not moving like cities or anything, but, um, mm. but, uh, it, it was tiring to kind of, kind of pack everything up and move everything over nonetheless. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, that part, that part did take up a bit of time and, and effort. Um, however, it is quite a, quite a nice new place. Um, and all my uh, appliances are working and stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it has most of the things that I, I need to, to get by. So I, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and this also means that this is our, our first episode that I'm recording in, at my new place. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. If you uh, notice any difference in the sound quality, you know, let, let us know or something. Um, but uh but yeah uh i suppose those are the main things that that have happened to me over the the you know the past couple weeks uh yeah just still working on stuff uh the move i guess counts as a fairly fairly large shift in my life but uh yeah i've been settling in and things are things are going okay (laughs) well i'm glad i'm really glad to hear that and you know i'm always you know rooting for you through this (laughs) thesis it's going to be I mean, it's going to be super amazing when it's all said and done. Uh, I, I think. So. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess as far as like updates are concerned, um, before we really kind of jump into our main news stories, you know, there there have been other exciting things that we, we've been engaged with mm-hmm. that uh, mm-hmm. are certainly of relevance to this series yeah. and um, mm-hmm. serve certain. Many of you in our audience will probably know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> if we can jump to the next slide. Yep. So back on Friday, September 3rd, we got to experience TetZoomCon. Mm-hmm. This is our second uh, 
our second instance of joining Tet Zoom Con from last year. So, oh, what is Tet Zoom Con? Uh, Albert, why don't you give us a why don't you give us the lowdown on what this is? In yeah, case there's sure. a couple of folks who don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, I can give it a try. So, uh, a Tet Zoom Con is run by a. Uh, uh, our friend Darren Nash, uh, who has been mentioned many times um, on our show, like you, you could probably make a drinking game out of like every time we uh, we mention his name on our show. Uh, but uh, he's a British paleontologist, and um, he is very well known for his um, blog uh, Tetrapod Zoology, where he blogs about pretty much all as aspects of uh, well Tetrapod Zoology, that is the zoology of um, uh, four-limbed uh, vertebrates, uh, so including amphibians, uh, reptiles, including birds, and also mammals, and plus the extinct um, stem lineages of all those groups as well. Um, and uh, his blog is very widely read and highly acclaimed. Um, and starting a number of years back, uh, he basically had garnered enough of an audience that he decided, yeah, let's make a convention uh, centered around uh, like the themes of this blog. And uh, I think, uh, oh, I forget when the first one was, to be honest, um, but uh, I, I know that I got to uh, first experience it um, in 2016. I think that's correct. Yeah, 2016, when I uh, first moved over to England to start my graduate studies. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so every year, basically, um, Darren uh, invites a number of uh, speakers. Uh, like um, oftentimes they are scientists, but not always. Um, like sometimes they are artists or you know say conservationists. Um, you know, any just about anyone who who is kind of involved in doing anything related um, to tetrapod zoology is fair game and so there's a huge variety of topics that are covered um, under this umbrella and so uh, there are always lots of great speakers I, I was honored once to to be a speaker for tetsukon um, i believe that was 2018 um, and yeah that was a lot of fun and uh, there are also all kinds of other activities um, at tetsukon there's usually a paleo art workshop where uh, darren invites uh, various paleo artists to to come in and show the attendees how they um, you know work their craft and so on uh, or share tips on uh, how they do paleo art um, and uh, also give the um, attendees an opportunity to do some of their own paleo art perhaps following the principles that they have learned from the um, the guest artists um usually the in-person convention usually has uh, like uh, people selling merchandise uh, it's a great place to you know uh, spend a lot of your money getting uh, zoology books or uh, uh, artwork or uh, <laughs> even plushies um yeah lo lots and lots of fun uh, merchandise uh, gets sold at tetsu uh, con um but um, of course, in the last couple of years, uh, in-person gatherings have uh, have been difficult to do, you could say, um, for obvious reasons. And so starting last year, uh, instead of an in-person TetsuCon, um, Darren has instead started organizing uh, these uh, Ted Zoom cons, which, uh, as the name suggests, um, occur over you know, the software Zoom, where people do video conferences and such. And so uh, it works in very similar ways, but of course, everybody joins from their own homes instead of traveling to some place in England. And um, there are uh, there are talks that are given um, as always. There's there's usually a paleo art workshop, and and like with the in person uh, Ted Zoom um, Ted Zoo con. Um, there, there's often like an after party at the end where everybody just kind of gathers together and chats about whatever you usually things related to tetrapod zoology but uh, the discussion can meander quite widely um and yeah um the tet zoom cons have so far been quite a lot of fun and of course has allowed uh, lots of people who normally would not be able to join in person to uh, participate in the events um such as yourself um so uh yeah it's uh, I, I think it's been pretty great uh the they um they of course um can't uh, replicate all the kinds of in person events um on Tetsum Konzo, for example. Uh there there's there isn't really any much selling merchandise there, for example. Um and um the the Tetsum cons are also uh, they tend to be shorter. Like uh the like before the pandemic hit, a lot of the Tetsu cons um tended to be uh, a couple days in length. Um whereas uh Ted Zoom cons take place over the space of like a British afternoon to evening kind of thing. So it's a lot shorter, but, you know, people are also just sitting in front of the computers for their for the entire time. So there's a lot. Uh, it makes sense to, to, you know, give 
give people uh, you know, more room for breaks and such. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, so I, I've attended, you know, every Tetsuicon or Tetsumicon since 2016 when I first went, and uh, they're always a lot of fun. Uh, this year's was also quite fun as well. Um, you know, what, what was your experience like? Well, oh my gosh. Uh, well, my first Tetsumicon was definitely a, a treat. So let me see if I remember. This was back in December, and we were like in the middle of you know, getting ready to sell the house and right. make the big changes. So it was kind of like a nice little highlight in the middle of all this, you know, stress and, and uncertainty. And, you know, it, it has always been a dream to go to, to a Tet Zoo Con. Yeah. Me and my sister Gabs at some point just, you know, get our passports, go to the UK right. and just meet all these people that I've been talking with and seeing online for you know years and years and years. Um, but I'm certainly very, very grateful to that you know, this is a thing that exists mm -hmm. now that I was able to essentially go to a Tet Zoo, the Tet Zoo Con uh, digitally. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, it was a blast. <laughs> um, and I mean, like, and th this year's uh, was especially fun too, um, because it was the first one where I actually managed to stay for quite a lot of it. Um, definitely, I think the steam compared to the two Tet Zoo Cons is interest was interesting because. Like this one was kind of a surprise announcement. I I, I believe yeah. Darren Reese was still kind of on the fence about you know, are we going to do another one? When is it going to be? So I, I feel like by the time it was announced, everyone was kind of like, oh, oh yeah yeah, uh, let me see if I can make that. <laughs> right right. Working into my schedule. Um, because I know I know the last one was like quite a while in advance and mm -hmm, right. Like it was so big. And people had like just more time to do it that like it extended into like two days um, the app like the after party discussion which i did not get to experience because by that point i was hungry and tired and mm. it was nine o'clock i hadn't had dinner <laughs> i was like you know time zones yeah. how do they work um but this time around it's definitely a lot easier i, I planned everything a lot better mm -hmm. and i managed to stay for quite a lot of it and i really enjoyed it um i'm always kind of tickled by the like like the diversity of the talks that are mm -hmm. presented here and, and and the people who come to speak yep. mm -hmm. um just to kind of like go through some of the names just to kind of do a quick roll call of what we had and just kind of give you an idea of like what what kind of things we deal with here at Ted Zoom Con so uh, they had a, a Kanan Raja uh, uh, from Singapore talking about roadkill mm -hmm. so you think like oh my gosh they're like dead animals but like there's a purpose it, it was about you know how to kind of deal with um you know wild animals that you know walk into the roads and the kind of attempts that people have been making to not only identify species that have been run over but how to prevent you know future collisions mm -hmm. and a big focus of that talk was on the, the herpetofauna so the, the the reptiles and amphibians that are around there and and it's kind of it was kind of a sad talk because a lot of like threatened reptile species end up as like vehicle collisions or mm -hmm. bike collisions often because of people who like deliberately try to run them over um because i guess like there's sort of a you know a stigma against scaly slimy things right um, which is a real shame but i mean it's fascinating research nonetheless um and then riley black a big fan of her work uh she was talking about patriophilus mm -hmm which is a it's a paleogene mammal so it lived you know in the period after the cretaceous and it has sort of like a compl complicated like classification history it, it it's considered a creodont which is sort of a, a group of carnivorous mammals that may or may not be related to living carnivorans mm -hmm. things like dogs and cats and seals um but that's i mean that's really kind of that was kind of like the besides the point of the talk I mean, you know what she was really interested in was look, looking at looking at the ecology of this animal because it, like it was traditionally described as like a cat-like or otter-like creature um but then when you look at the teeth and how like big and worn down they are and you notice that oh there's a whole lot of turtle fossils that are being found at the same sites where this animal is located maybe there's a possibility that patriophilus was a a, a turtle cruncher I think was the word they use, or the turtle chomper. Um, so it's like kind of like an invitation to like you know study these animals closer and like look at more 
and more remains to kind of get an idea of whether this is the case, mm -hmm. which is kind of fun. It's kind of an unexpected um, direction to take from an animal that is, you know, it has kind of a presence in like popular paleo books, but it's usually not really known outside of those contexts. Yeah. Um, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to ask people, do you know what Priodont is? It's like, what? <laughs> um, but then uh, let's see, we had a uh, Francois Louis Pellissier who was talking about this, um, it was like a, a this man-eating creature that was stalking, um, stalking Europe during the medieval era. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are all sorts of things about, you know, is this, you know, what is this creature? What's his identification? And he had kind of had the idea that it was a, um, one of the wolf subspecies that was attacking people. And that was kind of an interesting talk. So mm -hmm. you got to, you, you get a little bit of cryptozoology too in, in Tet Zoom Con, which oh, yeah. I, I think is always fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, admittedly, I'm not like like super deep into cryptozoology, but I think some of the stories, and especially like the cultural relevance of some of the stories, are interesting. Yeah, uh, that's kind of my stance on these things. Um, but honestly, one, one of the highlights for me, um, I, I don't know about you, um, was probably listening to Dwayne Nash's talk. Um, about his book, Dinosaur Enlightenment, which is sort of a, how do I describe this? It's kind of like a exploration of different ecologies and environments that like Mesozoic dinosaurs might've lived mm -hmm. in and kind of going beyond the sort of simple human dominated ecologies that we're used to studying today. And really kind of like, kind of breaking open the ceiling and really looking at, you know, maybe things are a lot stranger than we could have expected. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I kind of love stuff like that. And that was really fascinating because I, I had not read Dinosaur Enlightenment, but now I'm like definitely super interested in checking it out. Because um, it, it kind of like kind of goes to show that, you know, with deep time and the environments that are examined in the fossil record, there's nothing to suggest that anything has to follow the quote unquote rules of the present day. Mm -hmm. I mean, goodness knows what creatures were doing way back then that we haven't been able to really figure out before. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Uh, and then we had a uh, Elsie Pancaroli talking about her book beasts before us, which is basically about the story of mammalian and then synapsid evolution from the, you know, the, Paleozoic to the end of the Cretaceous period, mm -hmm. and how that story has been often kind of put on the sidelines of your popular, you know, history of the world studies, and how like there's actually a lot of really fascinating stuff that like Mesozoic mammals and, and Permian synapsids were doing that doesn't really get a lot of attention. And I really appreciated that one too. That's definitely another book that I'd love to check out. Um, and then things close with Darren Nash talking about the dinosauroid, mm -hmm. which is a speculative what if dinosaurs survive the mass extinction and some of the particularly brainy ones aka the troodontids developed human-like sapience and you might think like oh this is probably like a really like scientific discussion and it has a whole backstory that's like you know rigorous scientific you know you know it's it's speculative zoology like in the best sense and then like it turns out like oh probably not there's probably it's probably more ideologically driven than mm -hmm. You might think um which that was particularly interesting carl sagan was involved that was kind of fun <laughs> yeah. um but yeah so like as you can see just a a just a really grab bag of different topics and and each tet Zoocon is is very different and you never know who's gonna show up yeah. and uh, i loved everyone's talks and of course it was just so great to see everyone again and, and catch up with some folks you know talking you know one-on-one -on -one. Um, despite my own struggles, because I was trying to get my friggin' camera to work so I could like, so people can see my face. Yeah. But I guess my internet connection was crap, mm. you know, despite that. And, and, and it would like show me and then like cut off and just, I kept doing this over and <laughs> oh, over again. Funny. So if you saw me like flickering a bunch during Tet Zoom Con, who happened to be watching this, that's why that was going on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, not not too big of a deal though uh all in all i had a blast and uh you know part of me really hopes that even if you know things improve and and 
you know, there's regular Tetsuicons that are going to be happening again. That he still continues Tetsuicon for all the folks who don't mm. have the, the fortune to be able to travel to the UK and then experience it firsthand. Right. And uh, yeah, um, I mean, as far as like the talks are concerned, Albert, what was kind of your your personal highlight? Oh, um, yeah, like you know, Tetsuicon talks are always like you know pretty much uniformly excellent i i think personally my favorites were probably um um elsa pantarelli's talk on her new book um just uh you know not not so much because the information itself was new to me but more just uh because of how much the talk was focusing on kind of um her thought processes about what were kind of the main themes she wanted to include in the book like this is a a story that is not often told. So like what parts of it did she want to highlight and uh, what aspects of it did she really want to bring to the fore, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and she made a point of mentioning that, you know, she didn't um, just want to tell the untold stories of the um, organisms, the fossils themselves, um, but um, also like the people involved in the research of the fossils, um, yeah. oftentimes uh, whose contributions um, might have either been overly, uh, well, I guess glorified without uh, mentioning their problematic aspects or in other cases um, mm -hmm. have been neglected and have not really been mentioned um, uh, by popular accounts. Um, and so she tried to, you know, uh delve into both sides of that coin in, in her book and now I, I have not been able to um, get a chance to to read her book yet but uh, i'm certainly interested in doing so um so i i liked her talk a lot and um and definitely uh, riley black's talk on patriophilus was also really fascinating i I, I knew I knew of that animal, but um, yeah, I was not familiar with like how how gnarly its its teeth looked and such yeah, that, that was <laughs> really amazing to see for sure yeah um so yeah, absolutely a fantastic time. Um, I, I think this year's Tetsum Con was not quite as big as last year's. Um, and I think in part that's because of the reason you mentioned that it, it came at such short notice. I like, yeah, he, um, Darren pretty much announced it like two or three weeks before it actually started. And so I, yeah. I think a lot of people didn't really have time to like plan to attend basically. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it still got pretty darn big. And uh, I know Darren considers it to be quite successful um uh so yeah um if, if you you know if anyone is curious um i know darren has done a quick write-up of like you know all the events that happened um on his blog and he, he actually also has a recent article um where he goes into detail uh, about um um you know his thoughts on the dinosauroid which were basically the the subject of his talk and so if you didn't make it to TetsumCon or were curious about that uh, we can leave a link to that article in the description so you can read about that subject um and um as for the possibility of um uh, having more uh Ted Zoom cons in the future I, I have seen a uh, Darren say that he's considering um something similar for next year um even like yeah I, I guess e even if uh, things get uh, better and uh, in-person gatherings start uh, becoming the norm again. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I think uh, there there is hope that we can uh, look forward to more of more of these uh, because I, I do think um, I, I agree that there there are benefits to to the kind of digital format uh, that the past couple of TED Zoom cons have been. Um, and before I forget, uh, I should also mention that uh, these conventions are also co-organized by the paleo artist John Conway, who is a, a longtime collaborator um, mm -hmm. of Darren's. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, you know, um, uh, neglect his part in the in in that. So, yeah. Um, in any case, yes, Te Tetsuukon is, is as always an excellent time. I highly encourage like pretty much anyone who's interested in tetrapod zoology, like the, the subject, uh, but also the blog, I suppose, um, to to attend if you can. Um, and certainly, uh, Tetsuukon uh, gives a a greater range uh, of people the, the opportunity to do, to do so. So, yeah, that is excellent. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and just the after parties too. Are oh, just yeah. Kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> nothing is more entertaining than watching a whole bunch of like-minded naturalist individuals argue about discourse and paleontology and whatnot. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there was one part. There was one point where 
the the Cretaceous max extinction got brought up, and you know whether you know the the whole thing about you know was it the bolide that was like the main impact, or were there other things that were dooming the dinosaurs either beforehand or at the same time? And oh my gosh, all hell broke loose with that. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, that's always it's it's, you know, it's good. This, this kind of discussion is always good, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm sure a lot of folks had like a, a, you know important contributions to add to that. Um, but like I, I'm used to like the Twitter version of that whole right, stuff. Right. First, I think was just kind of uh, was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, de definitely a delight there. Um, on other equally uh, important news, um, so a, a couple, I think a few weeks back, there was an announcement by the animator and director David James Armsby, who is behind uh, the YouTube channel Dead Sound, and uh, you know he's done a lot of interesting work um he's not necessarily a like a full-time paleo artist mm. his interests are varied but he has worked on a number of uh, of projects that are very much paleontology related um most people in the paleo sphere are familiar with the short film sharp teeth which is sort of a, a look at perspectives about predators and prey which is i remember being kind of fun uh, there was another one that I can't remember the name of, but it was like a, a, a woman in the future who had like a pet dromaeosaur and she wanted to like free free the dinosaur. And and that was really it, it, very abstract, very interesting. Um, and so like it was, I was pleasantly surprised, as um, I'm sure a lot of people were, to see that uh, Mr. Armsby has been self-animating this short film series called The Dinosauria. Mm -hmm. And... It's basically the you know, the trailer dropped. Um, it's basically a series of I'd say vignettes uh, taking place during various uh, epochs of the Mesozoic, just looking at different dinosaurs and, and their daily lives. You know, it's very walking with dinosaurs sort of feel. Um, and uh, the first episode actually premiered yesterday uh, on the ninth. Um, and as I, I, if I remember correctly, we both have seen it at this mm -hmm. point. Yep. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, it's not. It's about four minutes. Um, it focused on the dinosaur park formation, and it involved a. It was a really cute story. It's called Old Buck. Um, it was a Styracosaurus, one of the horned dinosaurs, and it's kind of like you know the old you know dominant male who is kind of at the end of his run. You know he's he's lived a good full life and he's taking care of his herd. Um, and of course, there's always like the you know, younger ups who are trying to come up and take his place. He's still got a little bit of fire in him, and he mm -hmm. you know puts them in their place um oh it was it was, it was amazing I and mean, the animation is really lovely because like it, it's it's cg but he kind of does this sort of shell the cell shading thing mm. where it, it it looks very two-dimensional but you know everything is fluid the animals look great um a lot of research was put into this and uh i mean that first episode i i enjoyed it quite a bit um and how about you yeah, I enjoyed it a lot too. Uh, it was the, the storytelling was really impressive and uh, very immersive. I thought, like, uh, yeah, I well, while I was watching, uh, I noticed like you know before I started playing the video that the the video in total was something like four minutes long, and I, I think like mm -hmm. the the actual video itself, like you know, cutting out like the kind of end uh, portion of the video, like the actual animation itself, uh, was like almost but not quite four minutes. Um, and, and so I was like, okay, so this is like a, a pretty pretty decently long, you know, a film for, you know, the standards of like, well, what it is like a one person kind of project, um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I was going in expecting it to to be a moderately long film, but as I was watching, uh, it it was so immersive. I, the time just flew past, you know. I was like, "Wait, that, that that whole thing was four minutes." It was like, "Whoa!" Like <laughs> everything was like so engaging. I I just I just did it. Just didn't register to me. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely very impressive in in multiple ways. Um, I know that um when the trailer came out, um there there were some uh paleontology um, enthusiasts uh, who had uh, some scientific uh, nitpicks uh, about certain things that were shown in the trailer and i, I mean you know, i i noticed some some uh, scientific uh, kind of uh, inaccuracies or at least you know, think things you could take issue with um in the trailer too but uh, i i think um i 
I, I think for for what it is, I, I, this series uh, definitely deserves to to be commended. And um, I think um, something um, really um, interesting is that um, the Love in the Time of Chasmosaurus blog. Um, so they they also have their own uh, podcast, and they re they recently did um, an episode of the podcast where they interviewed uh, David James Armsby, and uh, he talked about you know kind of his intent and um, uh, his thought processes behind making this series. Um, which is really, really illuminating. And I, I really recommend uh, anyone who is interested in this series to go and listen to that podcast. Um, and he <laughs> made it very clear it, in that interview that uh, you know scientific accuracy is not kind of the main goal of this series per se. Uh, now he, he does try to make use of like the latest scientific understanding, like just about all the, um, uh, all the animals um, in the, in the series uh, are, uh, you know, for most part based on uh, kind of, you know, reasonable extrapolations from the latest scientific understanding about them. And for most part, they, they all look really, really good. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the series is not intended to be a documentary. It, it is primarily a storytelling exercise. Um, and so I, I, I think, um, uh, it's easy to get the wires crossed when you're seeing like, oh, these are like basically scientifically accurate animals. Uh, so, so it, it, it's it wants to it wants to like get everything right and realistic and all that. And that's not necessarily the case. It's it's more like mm -hmm. making use of um, like scientific knowledge, um, but like applying it to like some some somewhat a stylistic and a, and fictional kind of context. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and something else is that the the artist, you know, he he, he is not uh, an expert uh, on paleontology, um, so he he does mention in the interview that yeah, pretty much everything he he puts into the series is like based on his own like self taught uh, reading of of whatever's material is out there, and so all things considered, I think it's very very impressive that he he got things you know as accurate as, as he has. Um, now uh this this is um this is kind of kind of a fun thing i suppose so because uh for the record my main uh nitpick uh with the trailer when i saw it uh, from a scientific standpoint um was that in the trailer um there are some birds that are shown particularly there's a close up of one particular bird um in the uh in the trailer um that looks like essentially like a modern songbird basically um but uh you know modern songbirds were not around uh, during the time of the cretaceous which is where this series takes place and um and, and it doesn't really uh, look like any of the kind of birds or bird-like dinosaurs that would have been actually been around um and so i thought it was pretty funny that um that uh, David James Arnthy in the interview, he actually mentions that uh, in the interview because uh, when uh, when he is talking about like what inaccuracies got through uh, in into the series, he mentioned that yes, the bird uh, was like the one animal in the entire series that he did not base on like an actual uh, fossil species. Uh, he basically um, kind of assumed that modern, because modern type birds were around, there would have been like these, these you know, uh, birds similar to modern songbirds uh, in the in the late Cretaceous. But uh, yeah, he, uh, it turns out that he assumed wrong in that case. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the origin of, uh, of that particular error. But, um, you know, I, I thought like pretty much everything else looked great and, uh, uh, yeah, again, it, scientific accuracy is clearly not the focus of the series. So I, I think all things considered, uh, this is really, really impressive and uh, it's definitely worth a watch. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and we'll be sure to post both the um, the trailer mm -hmm. and the particular episode yep. so y'all can check it out and give them the support. Because, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's always nice to get like really good dinosaur content mm. and uh, this is definitely a, a nice treat especially since they're still kind of in that lag of like you know good dinosaur shows and documentaries and, and uh, you know anything is is, is perfect and uh, right. I, I i did quite I, I quite enjoyed what i saw and look forward to the rest of it for sure mm. so yeah so those are sort of our um paleosphere announcements at the moment but uh before we get into the main news episodes there are a couple of quick updates to things that we've talked about in the past if we could 
jump to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, back during our October 2020 new study, uh, we talked about a preprint paper by uh, Graham Anthony Shields and colleagues that was proposing a brand new pre-Cambrian timeline with a, a bunch of new subdivisions that were going to be more in line with the geologic record than before. Mm. Well, we can fast forward to this month, and we have the same team having released a template for an improved rock-based subdivision of the pre-Cryogenian timescale in the Journal of the Geological Society. Now, this is not a preprint, but it's an actual open access paper. And it really seems like the International Commission on Stratigraphy might be finally going forward with their proposals. Um, now, uh, in the paper, some of the new periods that they proposed, um, like the uh, the Scorian for the Proterozoic Eon, it's just a random example. You know, the, those have been actually retained in this paper, but others, and that means many of the new periods for the Archaean Eon that we had gone through bit by bit back in October, um, those are absent. And there is a very good reason for that because there were worries that the the use of the oldest known rock types of a certain sort that were made to define many of these periods, you know, those might be the result of sampling bias. And, you know, it, it might be a matter of time until, you know, older finds would push those oldest known rock types further back. So just to be safe, they're leaving the Archaean mostly alone and they're focusing on the, the Proterozoic Eon, um, you know, just, just to be safe. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely have to see if their proposals go forward. Hmm. Um, so uh, that's kind of exciting, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so uh, this, this next one, um, this is just a little aside from our one-year anniversary special. Um, our good friend Tristan had alerted me of this paper from 2019 by Charles W. Hellman colleagues that looked at how indigenous groups in South Africa studied fossils. Because this was relevant to my sister Julie's question about, mm -hmm. you know, the role of sort of pre-Western research on fossil animals. Um, you know, I hadn't seen this study before, but I mean, I was just immediately intrigued. So uh, Tristan specifically brought to my attention this little section and the, there's the figure here on the, on the right um, about the San Bushmen of a Mokali cave in Lesotho uh, who were very familiar with a series of Jurassic dinosaur footprints from what I believe the, the, the consensus is it's from an ornithopod of some sort. Hmm. Um, and they not only drew images of the tracks on the wall of the cave, but they also created reconstructions about what the animals who made them might have looked like. And you can kind of see them here in figure B. Um, you know, given that they're quite bird-like in appearance, uh, you know, they're certainly inspired by you know, ostriches and bustards and mm -hmm. secretary birds, which are all you know animals that are in the region. Um, it's certainly understandable. Um, but these are not, you know, dramatically far off from how these dinosaurs would have looked. You know. Uh, a bipedal ornithopod is sort of like a, a funky bird with a tail mm -hmm. <laughs> and then other, you know, distinctions. Um, so, yeah, like, what's especially cool is that, you know, even though these are, you know, these were recorded by ethnographers, you know, as early as 1930, um, there are records from other San in 1911, you know, where they were, the authors were writing down the oral traditions and they legitimately talked about the existence of large, monsters that made the tracks and how based on dinosaur bones that were also being found in the area the, the, the son recognized that these animals once existed but they no longer do so hmm. so we have a sort of a concept of extinction in this instance wow um now the the paper doesn't give any hints as to necessarily how old the macaulay cave images are but the implications are that these are quite old to the point where they probably predate, you know, European paleontologists like Mantell, mm. you know, who were first applying scientific methods to dinosaur fossils. So they're probably many, many centuries old. And 
oh, that's just so cool. <laughs> yeah. um, so I definitely wanted to share like this particular um, aspect of that paper because I think it'd be pretty interesting to kind of like bring that whole discussion from the anniversary special together. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think, Albert? I mean that that is amazing. Uh, <laughs> that is really cool, and that 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 is a great addition to the answer to that question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, concepts of extinction. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So I just kind of wanted to bring those to everyone's attention. But uh, now, uh, I believe we will move forward onto the next slide. Hmm. And uh, we'll start with one of my new sections first. Um, so this is one of two stories that came out last month about the history of humans in Southeast Asia. Uh, which has been the source of a whole bunch of new, really fascinating new developments in ancient DNA research. So I kind of put them together in one section. Now, little by little, we're getting tidbits of the past that are further fleshing out you know, what appears to have been a you know dynamic demographic history for this part of the world. Now, this paper is by a Maximilian Lorena and colleagues, and it looks primarily at the Philippines. Uh, which made headline news back in March when the same team published genomic data outlining various population expansions into the Philippines from southern Eurasia within the last 50,000 years. Uh, you might recall in Humanity, a prologue, I had outlined some of the research from that because it had come out at just the right time to talk mm. about it, which was super convenient. Um, but in this present analysis, uh, the team examined over 1,100 genomes representing 118 ethnic groups from across the archipelago. And these include many of the peoples that were examined in the earlier March study, like the Austronesian-speaking Cordillerans and uh, the Bonobo and the Sama, who share some ancestry with Austroasiatic speakers. Uh, you might remember these groups from Humanity of Prologue. Um, and especially relevant here, uh, the Negrito peoples. Now, I should, as an aside, uh, Historically, that term, which it it means little black person, you know, that's not one used by the that was that was not used by the people themselves, mm. but was imposed on them by the Spanish, you know, who had arrived in the Philippines during the 17th century. Um, there were assumptions by the Spanish and other Europeans that the Negritos were some sort of you know migrant Africans who just ended up living here in what is supposed to be an Asian domain, right? Um, and this was extended to other ethnic groups across the region, like the Andaman Islanders. Now, we know, of course, that this is not the case. And, and there has been some level of discourse about the status of Negrito as a label. Now, what's interesting is that in both of the Lorena et al. papers, so this one and the one back in March, um, they state outright that the people concerned self-identify with the Negrito label. Hmm. So it, it seems like at least among people of this ethnic group that the term is okay-ish. So we'll stick with that here for the time being, unless otherwise you know, we have good evidence to not do so. Um, but right, so recent genetic studies have demonstrated that the Negritos are the descendants of one of the oldest sapiens lineages to have settled in Southeast Asia over 50,000 years ago alongside the people who settled in Sahul. This is the landmass that includes Australia and New Guinea that was present during the last ice age. Um, you know, these gave rise, of course, to the Papuans of New Guinea and the Australian Aborigines. Um, we've also learned that our species wasn't alone in Southeast Asia during that time. A genetic and archeological studies point to the presence of the Denisovans and several Denisovan-like populations as well as the hobbits, Homo floresiensis, and the very enigmatic Homo luzonensis, which is a very recent find. We know that there were admixture events between the Denisovans and their relatives, at least, including one that occurred prior to the settlement of Sahul, which has left their trace in Australian, Papuan, and Melanesian peoples today. Uh, Denisovan DNA makes up 4 to 6% of their genome. And what this study found was that there was yet another distinct admixture event with the Nisovans, but in this case, it was only with the ancestors of the Negritos of the Philippines. Uh, and one ethnic group in particular, the Aita, a uh, gentleman of which is shown here at the left, uh, it was discovered that they had the highest proportion of Denisovan DNA in their genome of any living human population, on the order of 34 to 40% higher 
than that of the peoples of Sahul. Hmm. And you can see this significant difference in chart B on the bottom most image there. I mean, that is just fascinating. Um, so then the next question is, well, how recent is that mixture of events? You know, we know that one of the Nisib and Admixture events happened before the population split between Negritos and Sahulans. You can see that here in the in the little phylogeny as well. Um, so that means that the Philippine population met up with the Denisovans a second time after 50,000 years ago. You know, and this is just further evidence that Denisovans seem to have had a very widespread presence in Southeast Asia, even on islands that were not connected to the mainland as the region of Sunda, as it is called. Um, there has been previous work pointing to the possibility of Denise events even making it to Sahul and settling in New Guinea. I know we had talked about this before, um, which would mean that they had to have had, you know, been using watercraft of some sort to move around. And I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg regarding this research. Uh, where do other human species like Floresiensis or Luzonensis fit into this? You know, were they admixing with Sapiens and Denise events as well? Um, you know, how long was the Denisovan presence in Southeast Asia and Oceania in the first place? Uh, because we have genetic evidence of at least one admixture event with Papuans in New Guinea as late as 30 to 25,000 years ago. So long after their relatives, the Neanderthals, had died out Western Eurasia. And certainly long after evidence of other hominins vanishes, vanishes from the region. So clearly there's still quite a lot to learn. Now, if we move to the next slide and we move a little bit more forward in time to the Holocene, hmm. uh, we have this paper by Selena Karlhoff and colleagues in which they are the first to sequence the genome of a 7,000-year-old individual who belonged to the Taolian techno complex. Now, this was an archaeological culture that first emerged on the southern end of the island of Sulawesi, around 8,000 years ago, and has been known since 1902, at least, when the cousin duo of Swiss naturalists, Paul and Fritz Sarasen, were doing fieldwork there, uh, looking at everything from ethnography to herpetology. Now, a common tool technology that was found at various Taolian sites are known as Maros points, and I've included a drawing of them here at the bottom left, uh, which are usually triangular, and they sometimes have a hollow base like a spear point or an arrowhead uh, and they have these really funky serrated edges um, but we're actually not sure what they were used for because not all, not all of them have this sort of hollow base like you can see here mm -hmm. so a little bit of a mystery there um, we know the Taolians also used bone tools and uh, there is evidence that they utilized resources from both the land and the sea of course, given their geographic location, they appear to have been fairly capable marine navigators. And it turns out they are prime suspects for the people who may have introduced the ancestors of the dingo and the New Guinea singing dog to Sahu. Wow. Uh, which is a discussion that I did not know about until fairly recently. <laughs> so if you like, consider that a little update to episode 10 of Humanity, a Prologue. Um, but beyond these details, not much is known about them and their relationship to other humans. Um, the traces of the Tualians actually vanished from the archaeological record by 1,500 years ago, after what appears to have been a period of occupation by Austronesian-speaking agriculturalists. So, by sequencing this genome of this individual who lived between 7.3 and 7.2 thousand years ago, you know, this has the potential to reveal a lot of clues. And already we're getting some major insights. Um, based on comparisons from neighboring peoples in Southeast Asia, as well as from Eurasia as a whole, uh, it appears that the Tawalians belong to a lineage of sapiens that is most closely related to East Asian populations and branched off at roughly the same time that the Papuans and Aboriginal Australian nations had stopped admixing with each other, uh, which, you know, as uh, Sahul was, you know, getting overrun by rising sea levels, and it was cutting off New Guinea from Australia for the last time. Um, and that puts them at around 37,000 years old. So this means that they would have entered Southeast Asia after the ancestors of the Negritos 
but before Austroasiatic speaking peoples expanded into the region. All in all, the authors state uh, the Taolians represent an undescribed ancestry profile, you know, which is always a delightful surprise in ancient DNA studies like this. <laughs> so, uh, if the ancestors of the Taolians were around, you know, 37,000 years ago, well, that means there's a possibility that they may have come into contact with Denisovans. And the authors did find that this individual carried Denisovan ancestry that they describe as, and I quote, substantial, but is also at a lower percentage than it is in Australian Aborigines or Papuans. So the data suggests that this Denisovan ancestry has been diluted over time through later admixture events with other Southeast Asian groups. But at present, we're not really sure about the specifics of those events. And speaking of ancestry, the Tuolian genome does contain evidence of genetic drift with peoples of Sakulan ancestry. In fact, that makes up 51% uh, of their DNA, as you can see here in the chart, the chart C. Um, unfortunately, the authors don't comment too much on this. Believe me, I looked. Um, hmm. But it does make me wonder how that occurred. Um, I mean, forms of genetic drift include the founder effect, which is when a a small sample of one population moves to a new location. And because of the reduced number of genes from the source population, those then become spread out across the new population as the generations go on. Mm. But then there's things like genetic bottlenecks, which are you know much more severe, and they usually involve something like a natural disaster, mm -hmm. reducing the population. But I, I'm fairly sure that this is not the case here. Um, Part of me wonders whether this instance of genetic drift has anything to do with the you know, proposal that the Tuolians sail to Sahul and introduce domestic dogs. You know, maybe they were meeting up with some people while they were there and they you know, brought them back with them hmm. to live with them. Um, so yeah, I, I think a significant takeaway from this paper is that there is no known evidence of Tuolian ancestry in any living populations in Southeast Asia. Um, the authors did not find any in the groups that they tested, but they do stress that this could either be the result of either, and here I'm quoting again, the overall limited proportion of near Oceanian related ancestry in Wallacea, or large scale genetic discontinuity between earlier hunter gatherers and modern groups, which suggests that say the Austronesian expansion into Southeast Asia might have obscured any Tuolian ancestry in subsequent generations, mm. which is a thing that happens. Um, but we're definitely going to need more research to be sure. But my goodness, is this a first you know, great step in unraveling yet another mysterious people yeah. of the past? Um, so yeah, those are basically my two stories about Southeast Asia. Um, a really convenient mix that they both you know, premiered, you know, during last month, and mm -hmm. I got to talk about both of them here. Um, the Tuali one is especially fascinating. Um, Albert, do you have any comments on these? Um, not too much, uh, but uh, I, I'm with you there that this kind of ancient um, DNA study is always, like, really fascinating and often very insightful, um, and it is excellent that we are getting more of these from such an understudied um, region, um, and yeah, it is fascinating that the kind of influence of the Denisovan uh, DNA seems to be particularly great um, here. Yeah, I, you know, I just uh, just wonder what was going on there. It, it's it's um, tantalizing to think about. Um, and I, I guess the one one other thing that's uh, not directly related to the genetics, but that I noticed on this slide is um, that uh, that tool pictured on the lower left there that. That's a pretty cool looking tool. Do we know what they were used for? Um, not at all. Wow. Um, and and the biggest reason is some of them have the sort of hollowing at the base mm -hmm. that you know it looks like oh this is attached to a spear right. or maybe an arrow. Uh, I mean we know bow and arrow technology was known by at least forty thousand years ago or so in Eurasia, so it's not too far fetched. Mm -hmm. But we also find these tools without those flakes, um, hmm. you know, without, without those flakes removed. Yeah. So, yeah, at present, there's not, it's not really, we're not really sure at, at the moment. Um, huh. I looked at some of the literature on Tawalian tools, uh, these Maros points, and uh, 
I mean, for one thing, like the classification of these tools has gone through a little bit of controversy too, because um, I guess some previous authors had maybe like unceremoniously lumped different tools together that actually weren't related to each other mm. in terms of like make and model. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> they had to go in and like kind of fix all that and make a new classification scheme. Mm. Uh, I mean, tool technologies are just, they're a whole can of worms in and of themselves mm -hmm. to try to wrap your head around. But uh, I mean, the points are not very big. I mean, you, you could easily fit one between your thumb and index finger. Mm. Um, so I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they had something to do with, you know, hunting or fishing right um, i mean certainly the serrated edges would help with like kind of embedding the tools into flesh to kind of keep the prey from wiggling away right um but yeah at the at, at present there's no consensus on those marvelous points at, at present huh. wow hmm. so clearly a lot left to learn but uh yeah that's what makes this field so exciting <laughs> oh yeah i mean the tawalians uh like when i mentioned that i did not know about these people until fairly recently like I, I, I decided to dig through all of my archaeology books, and except for maybe some passing mentions of the Maros points, mm. they are not mentioned at all. Wow. So it, it really kind of goes to show, at least for my personal journey, that there is quite a lot in anthropology that I have yet to really explore, mm. and it just kind of reminds me how amazing this field is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. But yeah, if you like, we can move on to your first story. All right. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, so for my first story, uh, we're going to be talking about um, catfishes, uh, which is uh, quite quite a jump, uh, still vertebrates, but uh, fairly distantly <laughs> related from us. Um, but uh, I thought it was a pretty interesting study, so um, as you know, we we typically do when we choose these stories. So um, yeah, let, let's have a look at what's up here. Um, so I, I guess as a bit of background, um, the uh, the vertebrates have uh, evolved ways of moving around on land multiple times. Um, of course, um, the most diverse group of uh, terrestrially adapted vertebrates are the members of our own lineage, um, the tetrapods, which evolved from uh, lobe-finned fish. Um, however, uh, there are other groups of uh, fishy vertebrates that have evolved ways of getting around on land, and uh, some of them um, are quite effective at it. They can move from, uh, you know, from between different bodies of water, um, they can survive on land for quite long periods of time. Um, like, uh, I guess, as some some examples, uh, mudskippers uh, are probably a pretty well known one. Uh, these uh, these are a type of um, uh, goby uh, goby fish. Uh, they live uh, mostly in, uh, I think, like tropical and subtropical regions of the world, and uh, they spend most of their time on mud flats uh, uh, next to next to uh, estuaries and and the ocean, but. Um, you know, spending most of their lives on land and uh, living in burrows. Um, and they can crawl around on land using their pectoral fins, so uh, the equivalent of our forelimbs, uh, which allows them to kind of push themselves around on land. Um, there are, uh, for example, many species of eels can, can travel between bodies of water by sort of like wiggling around on land, like slithering, like almost snake-like. Um, and they can uh, travel across quite, quite uh, long distances over land. Um, and so uh, this ability has kind of evolved many, many times uh, in different groups of fishes. Um, and you can imagine why it's a pretty beneficial trait to have. Like if uh, your body of water that you're living in dries up, then uh, it helps to be able to move from place to place. Or, you know, even if it doesn't dry up, but you, you know, just need to disperse to somewhere else, maybe your food ran out or whatever. Uh, this is a very helpful kind of ability to have, especially if you live in bodies of water um, that are uh, kind of ephemeral or not, you know, they, they might be temporary or they might not be connected to larger bodies of water where you can swim to. Um, so yeah, lot, lots of different types of fishes have adapted to this kind of terrestrial uh, locomotion. Um, and so uh, this particular study focused on a group of catfishes. Uh, catfishes are a really diverse group of fishes, and uh, frankly, I'm not really the person to, to tell you about them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they are mind-bogglingly diverse. And so uh, this particular study looked at a particular group of catfishes um, that have been called the Neotropical Suckermouth Armored Catfishes, um, or the group Loricaridae. And uh, as uh, that rather long kind of common name suggests, uh, they are found in the American tropics. Um, they have a sucker-like mouth, which they use to kind of cling to like substrates underwater, so things 
to like rocks, for example, and they use it to kind of graze um, food off of these uh, aquatic substrates. So uh, especially algae, they like to they like to eat algae, or scrape algae off of rock surfaces or at the bottom of pools or whatever, and. Um, they are also armored, so they have like the, these armor plates kind of embedded into their skin, which uh, provides them with a, a pretty, uh, you know, effective defense against predators. Um, and a lot of these uh, neotropical sucker mouth catfishes um, are popular um, pets, uh, so people often keep them in aquariums. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is because of how effective they are at eating up the algae that uh, builds up within aquariums. So they're, they're kind of a, a helpful pet to have in that sense. Um, However, um, because of the fact that they are uh, kept all around the world as pets, uh, they have also become invasive uh, in many regions of the world, and people, you know, mm. just kind of dump them outside into the wild and uh, where they don't belong. Um, many of them have been introduced to regions that they are not native to. Um, Fortunately, they can't survive in waters that are too cold. Um, so uh, they, in some regions, uh, they haven't been able to spread too far. But uh, it is a, they can be a real problem in uh, some of the warmer regions of the world. Um, and so, for example, uh, their grazing behavior can kind of disrupt uh, like the, the algal growth in certain ecosystems um, where, you know, maybe that ecosystem is used to having a certain amount of algae in the water, but then these fish fishes come along and eat them all up. Um, these uh, catfishes also dig burrows, which can destabilize like waterways um, where they're not used to having these kind of burrowing fish around. Um, so, yeah, they can be problematic in some regions. And it has uh, long been reported anecdotally that uh, these neotropical sucker mouth armored catfishes uh, are able to move on land. But no one has really studied like in detail how they are able to do this. And so... Um, the new study that came out last month uh, decided to tackle this subject. And so what they did was they kept uh, three different species of these loricarid uh, catfishes. Um, and then they built this little arena for them in their lab. Uh, basically, they, they, basically what it is is a, is a fenced-in area um, in the lab, uh, fenced-in using a kiddie pool. <laughs> And they just put the um, uh, the fishes inside this kind of fenced in area and watched how they move across the ground, pretty much. And they they filmed uh, how they moved and also analyzed the footage that they took um, uh, to better understand this kind of behavior. Um, and what they found was quite interesting. Uh, it turns out that this these catfishes um, they use an unusual kind of gait that has not been recorded in any other type of animal. Um, that has been studied so far. Huh. That's pretty interesting. Um, so uh, here's a sequence of photos on this slide that shows basically how this gate works. Um, and so what happens is first the catfish, as you can see in the top row, kind of uh, bends um, its tail and its head uh, strongly in one direction. Um, and then um, it kind of retracts its, uh, its fins that were previously stuck out to one side um, while it's in this position. And then it kind of flicks its head and tail back, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in the direction they came from uh, to align them with its body. Um, and that kind of throws the catfish uh, forward as it does so. And while it's like moving forward, it sticks its fins back out again uh, on the left side of its body in this case um, to stabilize it. And so it doesn't to make sure it doesn't overshoot and start going in circles basically so it kind of straightens its pathway like that um, and then it does this again and again and moves moves along the ground that way um, something that's worth mentioning it is is that the catfishes um, especially in the uh, smaller species the tail is not always like actually directly contacting the ground in this case so they're not really um, so much pushing themselves forward uh, by you know throwing their tail against the ground. Um, they're kind of flinging themselves forward more like uh, when they kind of uh, bend their tail and then kind of straighten it out very quickly again. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty unusual kind of gait. And uh, not only in terms of like the sequence of steps that they do to uh, perform it, but also the fact that it is an asymmetrical gait. Um, you can see here that, you know, the tail bends much more strongly in one direction than the other. It doesn't, it doesn't bend the tail 
first in one direction and then bend it equally strongly in the next direction and so on, which is typically what we expect for like cyclic gates like this. Like uh, think of how you walk, for example, you step forward with one foot and then you step forward with the next foot kind of reaching forward with roughly the same amount of distance and then so on and so forth. And that's a pretty effective way of moving around. But these catfishes, um, you know, they're, they're using an asymmetrical gait where they kind of bend their body more strongly in one direction than the other. And they're only kind of sticking their fins out, uh, protruding them uh, far in only the uh, one particular direction as well. So uh, yeah, a very unusual type of movement. And because this kind of movement has not been uh, recorded in any other kind of animal before, the uh, researchers decided to coin a new name for it. Um, and they decided to use the term Reffling to describe this kind of locomotion, so that that's a kind of a fun word, um, yeah. So that that's pretty interesting. And uh, then the uh, researchers also discuss, um, you know, why these uh, catfishes uh, use this kind of really unusual locomotion that is not seen in any other uh, kind of animal that we know of. And um, they suggest that it's probably because of their armor. Basically, uh, their armor probably prevents. Um, you know, their bodies from being particularly flexible. Uh, and it also reduces the flexibility of their fins as well. So normally, uh, most uh, kind of fishes that are able to use terrestrial locomotion, they either push themselves along with their pectoral fins, or they kind of wiggle from side to side and sort of slither or kind of flop along the ground. Um, but those two aren't uh, really options for these armored catfishes. Um, and so that's probably why they are kind of restricted to this kind of really unusual and seemingly, uh, you know, I don't know about inefficient, but kind of roundabout way of, of moving around. Um, however, uh, they do also mention that uh, the um, armor might actually benefit them in other ways. By making their body stiffer, they might actually be able to transmit more force uh, when they're doing this like a lo locomotion against the ground compared to um, other types of uh, terrestrial the locomoting fishes um, and in this way uh, they actually report that uh, these catfishes are among the fastest fishes on land now oh, wow. um, yeah <laughs> now uh, compared to you know vertebrates that are actually adapted to you know living on land uh that's not much to write write home about um however uh, it, it is pretty impressive for uh, an aquatic vertebrate uh, to be able to move at speeds that they observed um these fishes moving at um so yeah that that's pretty fun um it actually um kind of reminds me of a i might have mentioned this before on the show so uh, back in the mid 2000s the bbc did a sort of a special um where they uh uh, they called it the, the animal games, uh, which is uh, basically uh, what would happen if all the animals got together and did their own version of the Olympic Games. And <laughs> yeah, and um, in, in that um, show, what they did was they you know, had, had all these events like the 100 meter dash and such, uh, high jump to long jump. Um, and with several others, um, and they resized all the animals um, because um, they, they included like everything from insects to like mammals, and and so they, they resized all the animals to be the same size as a human, um, and ignored a square cube law and said, okay, so how how fast or how strong or you know how how impressive would these animals be uh, if they were scaled to the same size as a human, and were able to kind of retain their proportional kind of abilities, and uh, so I remember in the um, hundred meter dash, um, the fishes sent a representative which was the walking catfish which is a different type of catfish that is also able to walk around on land um and uh, it does so in a more kind of normal uh, fishy fashion it kind of slithers along the ground um, but um you know it, it was up against some pretty stiff competition so it came in last place uh, so you know compared to uh, kind of terrestrial animals uh, even the fastest um uh terrestrially adapted uh, uh fishes, non-tetrapod fishes, um, it can't exactly go particularly fast, but it, it was pretty funny um, in that, to, to watch that special and, and see that, you know, oh, there, there actually is a fish that can compete in this event, even though um, it, it, it doesn't really have much of a shot at winning anything. Um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, like may maybe if that special was made uh, today, then then maybe they would have sent in the, one of these armored catfishes. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if it is actually faster than the. I, I think it might be uh, because the the researchers in the paper said that um, the armored um, catfishes are the fastest um, of all terrestrial fishes that use uh, 
motion of the that use a wiggling motion of their body to move um like uh, as opposed to like using the pectoral fins um so uh yeah i think uh, these armored catfishes might be the new kind of champion of like uh, of like um terrestrial non-tetrapod vertebrates in terms of movement speed on land um so yeah that, that's kind of interesting um and kind of lastly uh, um the researchers mention that uh, this has implications for uh, kind of um, invasive species control because as i mentioned that these uh, these catfishes are um, invasive in, in some parts of the world um and so uh basically what they're saying is that well uh you shouldn't try to um eliminate these fishes by like throwing them out onto the bank um, and hoping that they'll die there basically um, because we know that they're pretty effective at moving on land so it's quite likely that if you just throw them out onto the bank they can just move to another body of water and continue you know being uh, destructive to the environment there and so yeah uh, basically keep that in mind when you're trying to manage uh, these invasive populations um yeah so uh, i thought that was a uh, pretty interesting uh do you have any further thoughts well, I'm kind of actually surprised that that was supposed to be an effective strategy for <laughs> removing catfish. Just, right. just throw them on the land. Like, they, they don't, like, you know, put them in a bag or a tank or something and bring them somewhere else. They just toss them out of the water. Oh, yeah. People would do that. <laughs> that's, oh, that, that just kind of cracks me up. But, uh, I mean, yeah, that's certainly good advice now. Right. Um, gosh, no, that's incredibly fascinating. Um, yeah, it, it, it kind of makes me wonder. Um, we had talked about uh, anti-arc placoderms a couple right. news yeah. episodes back, right. and uh, part of me wonders, like, if you know, if, if they were in a certain situation that, like, some of those species, like maybe Bothyrolepis, if they needed to move from like pond to pond, like they could shuffle their bodies in this way too. Right. So, yeah. I, mean, I, I imagine, like, if, I mean, for them, it it might be a little bit easier because I mean, like, they have the armored pectorals that they could use too right to stabilize them um just, just a little speculation but uh oh yeah among the fastest fishes <laughs> on land but but then you said like that's like using like the body to move not necessarily right. the yeah yeah i'm not sure how they compare to something like mud skippers for example but uh, yeah <laughs> i was gonna say yeah because those guys are uh i mean uh, i remember watching life like, right two of them like going at it on land like that's a <laughs> yeah <laughs> The speedy fish, right? <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty effective at moving around. That's for sure. I've seen them in the wild, and yeah, they're they're pretty cool. But um, but but yeah, like pretty impressive. Um, and um, yes, I I do know people have like suggested that some of those placoderms might have been able to move around on land, uh, like you know for for similar reasons, like they they look like they might be able to right with with the kind of armored and jointed uh, pectoral um, girdles. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how well accepted that is nowadays. I think it. I think it's one of those things where there, there isn't much evidence for it. But uh, like people also haven't really looked that deeply into the subject, anyways. So oh, it's like, yeah. yeah. It's one of those. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, it's possible. It's it's possible. But uh, yeah, it needs more study, basically. <laughs> yeah, that that's totally fair. Um, well, this is wonderful. So we got a new a new, new coinage for a, a form of locomotion and, and remarkable insights into this behavior. Like, mm. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, well, I guess if there's not anything else to add, I guess I'll, I'll jump into my, my second panel of, of stories. Sounds good. Um, or story, I should say. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, this is kind of fun. This is a study by uh, Lauren Henson and colleagues. And it focuses on the Pacific Northwest of North America, specifically coastal British Columbia. Uh, what is especially notable about this research is that the authors collaborated very closely with several Native American nations that have lived in the region, including the uh, Shimshian, uh, the Wicanuk, and the Nootshalk. And the team was interested in understanding the genetic history of grizzly bears in the region in the hopes to better aid the indigenous communities with wildlife management, conservation, and especially coexistence. As sometimes there are hidden details in the population histories of wild animals that can affect such matters. I mean, goodness knows how many times 
there was a, a genetic analysis on a species of, an, of, of primate or, and it's like, oh, you're actually dealing with two species here, mm. not one. Right, <laughs> and it's right. like, oh, this is, you know, important implications. Um, uh, in the case of the grizzly bears, the authors wanted to see if there were any links between their genetic diversity and the human cultural diversity along the coast. And if there was, what factors played a role in shaping their structure? You know, did humans uh, influence shape where the bears lived and vice versa? Um, are there any landscape barriers like waterways or forest lines that have limited movement? Well, the team discovered that the grizzly bears in British Columbia fall into three distinct populations. You can see these here on the chart. And that the greatest spatial overlap corresponds with Native American language groups. Huh. So uh, specifically the, the Shimshian here in blue, uh, the Wakashian here in green, and the uh, Salishan Nukshalk here in red. Wow. Now, why should this be? Um, when examining so-called resistance surfaces so like the aforementioned waterways and forest lines things that are like barriers to movement uh, or, or usually are seen as barriers to movement um it was revealed that they actually played little to no role in affecting where bears and humans lived and moved hmm. you know at most it was geographic distance that contributed significantly and, and this suggests that delineations shown are the result of shared land use practices by more or less isolated groups of bears and humans who were much more likely to interact with others inside their communities rather than between them. Now, this can help somewhat with resource distribution, which ensures that everybody is able to utilize the entire landscape without overtaking or outstripping any one space. Now, the, the authors do state, however, that the distribution of the language families probably has more to do with sociocultural and historical factors than just geography, as mm. is usually the case for these sorts of things. Um, but at the very least, you know, this research provides some interesting findings that lead to equally interesting speculation. For example, in the paper, there is a question about whether the, the distributions of the bears and humans may be a result of the last glacial maximum, hmm. you know, which might have isolated both groups into these pockets or refugia between ice sheets as they were receding. Um, now, more specifically, there is the consideration that Native American nations on the Pacific Northwest have always revered and respected grizzly bears and have actively managed their contact with them since the earliest times. Um, in fact, the, the paper opens with a dedication to the late uh, Noakwa, who was a member of the Wakashan Nation, who, and I quote, taught us that people learned their language and way of life from the bears. And uh, I, I think studies like this are super important mm. if we want to preserve wildlife and human cultural diversity, because more often than not, the two are intimately linked. I mean, goodness, we, we've shown many times in this series how indigenous groups played active roles in shaping their landscapes and managing animals and plants. And these findings, it seemed to only add to that picture. And, and it must be remembered, importantly, that it's usually Western scientists who are just now learning these things. Um, the authors did note that Native American elders and community members weren't quote unquote surprised that grizzly bear populations overlaid with language groups mm. because it is they and their ancestors who have ultimately spent more time with bears and thus learned their life ways. Mm. So I, I thought this was a particularly fascinating study for sure. Um, it really kind of gets into an important role nowadays that you know, uh, wildlife biologists, geneticists, anthropologists should really be collaborating closely with the groups that are involved in their studies, regardless mm -hmm. of their relationship to the material covered, because more often than not, both groups benefit and we can all kind of come to, you know, a, a more 
responsible approach to doing scientific studies than just kind of going into a place, doing work, and then shuffling out without so much as a, hey, this is what we're doing. Right. Or kind of like, you know, uh, underscoring the importance of like local factors into these sorts of studies. Because again, it's like, you know, you're looking at these populations of grizzly bears and the fact that they align fairly closely. Um, I mean, if you're curious on the chart, the little gray lines represent the language divisions. Mm. And uh, so the colors, of course, represent the bears. Um, usually, like, if you don't consider like indigenous peoples on the land and their relationship to the wildlife in these studies, like you can often miss important details mm -hmm. that you know, might betray um, what is otherwise like a, a very close link between the two groups. You know, wildlife are not wild in the sense that they don't come into contact with people at all. Right. You know, <laughs> and then not as we're finding that um, the relationships between the two are very, very close. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm particularly glad that there are studies like this that are able to show this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, I remember seeing um, news articles about this study and wow, that's, it's, uh, well, what an, what an incredible finding. And uh, um, while it, uh, you know, wasn't a surprise to the Native Americans involved, like, it certainly was a surprise to me. And yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a really cool study, I think. And um, for pretty much all, all the reasons you said, and uh, it really underscores, yeah, the importance of um, kind of interdisciplinary um, approaches uh, when you're looking at these kinds of things, because if you're only focused on one specific subject or one specific aspect of something, it's easy to miss this kind of pattern, and that can have really important implications for understanding um, whatever uh, subject, you know, subject that you are studying. Um, so yeah, that, no, I, I'm definitely um, very impressed by the study, and uh, I really look forward to seeing people do more of this kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I I agree. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, well, if we like uh, Albert, can we? We'll go to your your final news story. Sounds good. Alrighty. So uh, this study um, is uh, notable in a couple ways. Um, first of all. Um, this is the first study, first uh, scientific paper um, published um, that is, well, it is co-authored, uh, but um, she is also the first author of, of the paper uh, by our friend uh, Charlotte. Um, and uh, so, yeah, major congratulations to getting her first paper out. Um, I have been through the process and I know how tricky it is. So, yeah, this is this is a huge yeah, you know, huge accomplishment, and so uh, that is one reason why I wanted to talk about this study. Um, but uh, the other reason is that I really think it is a very interesting study. Um, and so, uh, what this study looks at um, are basically the canals that run through the um, the skull of um, crocodilians and a particular um, group of uh, their extinct relatives. Um, these canals are called um, neurovascular canals, and uh, they are basically canals for the blood vessels and the nerves that are running through the skull to pass through. And uh, one of the reasons that we are interested in uh, looking at uh, these structures is that in modern crocodilians, so crocodiles and alligators and gharials, um, they have very complex uh, kind of neurovascular canals in their snout. Um, and on the left-hand side here is pictured a uh, gharial skull, so a modern crocodilian with a very long and slender snout. Um, and uh, what they did was they basically scanned the skulls of the crocodilians and their extinct relatives that they were looking at. And then uh, after scanning them, they could build a, basically a 3D model of these skulls um, in a computer and then look at the structure of the canals within the snout, um, you know, without actually having to cut the actual physical skull open or anything like that. So this is a, basically another study that demonstrates how useful a CT scanning has become to us in our studies in paleontology. Um, and so um, what they found, uh, basically the colored uh, parts of the figures here are, are showing um, uh, images of these uh, neurovascular canals. Um, so uh, on the top 
uh, left of each image is showing these canals being viewed from the top down, and uh, on the bottom left of each image is showing uh, these canals um, being viewed from the side. And so in uh, modern crocodilians, um, there are three kind of parallel uh, major uh, neurovascular canals that run through the snout um, side by side. And so the biggest one of these is the one marked uh, DAC and is uh, colored in red uh, in these figures. Um, so this is called the dorsal alveolar canal and is a canal that passes kind of above the tooth sockets. And the tooth sockets are the structures that are marked in uh, blue. And so that's why you can kind of see they, they look like uh, they they, they are shaped like crocodilian teeth because they are the spaces where the teeth would fit into. Um, and so the, the blue are the tooth sockets. Uh, dorsal alveolar canal runs above them. Um, but then um, there are two other uh, canals that run side by side um, parallel to the dorsal alveolar canal. And these are shown in yellow. So one is called um, the CPA uh, in this in this image, and that's a that's a canal that feeds uh, nerves and blood vessels to the uh, palate, um, and uh, there's another one called a CIS that uh, runs to the side of the dorsal alveolar canal, and uh, that canal uh, feeds nerves and blood blood vessels to the skin on the side of the snout, um, the integument uh, or body covering, as they say. So uh, yeah, we have these three different. Um, uh, canals that run parallel in the snout of modern crocodilians. And something you, you'll notice uh, in the modern crocodilian uh, snout is that uh, the uh, yellow canals as pictured here um, are very complex. You can see all kinds of little branches like shooting off of them. Um, and uh, the reason for that uh, in part is because uh, modern crocodilians um, in, in all cases on their snouts, but in, in some cases also on the rest of their bodies as well, have a series of like sensory organs that kind of uh, are scattered across their skin. Um, these are called integumentary sensory organs, and they uh, come in little pits that are kind of pockmarked uh, across, all across their skin. Uh, if you look very carefully like uh, at a close-up of like a crocodilian snout, you'll see all these little, little pits. Um, and uh, what they are used for and how they're used um, is still a subject that is being actively studied at the moment, but um, they do seem to uh, be very useful uh, structures that help crocodilians sense all kinds of stimuli. Uh, notably, they sense, uh, for example, changes in water pressure. So uh, if you know, a crocodilian is lying in wait in the water um, and uh, a uh, fish or some other prey item swims by, they can detect the kind of ripples that the, the prey generates as it moves to the water and so on, using these integumentary sensory organs. Um, and there's evidence that they might be able to sense other things like, say, temperature as, as well using these organs. Um, so, yeah, these are uh, very useful for them as they navigate or uh, are uh, feeding or hunting uh, in their kind of aquatic environments. And uh, because they have this really complex system of uh, integumentary sensory organs, um, modern crocodilians have these very complex um, uh, neurovascular canals in their snout. Um, and these neurovascular canals uh, connect um, to uh, branches, or they, they hold uh, branches from one of the uh, cranial nerves, the uh, nerves of the head. Um, uh, that particular nerve is called the trigeminal nerve, which, uh, among other things, uh, deals with uh, kind of uh, sensations in the face. And so, yeah, it makes sense that you would have like branches of the trigeminal nerve kind of feeding into these neurovascular canals that uh, in turn connect to the integumentary sensory organs. And so... Uh, you know, there, there's kind of a question is that, uh, so did the extinct relatives of um, crocodilians, um, their close extinct relatives have, also have this kind of sensory system? Um, and there, there's actually also um, some open questions about whether certain uh, non pseudosuchian archosaurs, that is, archosaurs that are not uh, members of the crocodilian lineage and are instead closer to birds, um, whether any of them had this kind of uh, uh, kind of complex facial sensations because uh, this has been suggested for some types of Mesozoic dinosaurs like uh, um, Spinosaurus, um, Neovenator, uh, some other theropods um, like Tyrannosaurids even um, have been suggested uh, based on kind of the pitting on their snouts that they might have had uh, integumentary sensory organs uh, similar to crocodilians and used their faces for kind of this kind of very uh, 
uh, sensitive tactile uh, sensation. Um, now, uh, this study um, was not about uh, um, dinosaurs, uh, but they instead looked at one particular group of stem crocodilians, a Mesozoic group called the Metriorhynchoids, and the Metriorhynchoids are an interesting group of uh, stem crocodilians because uh, they were marine, and uh, they were highly specialized for living uh, an aquatic lifestyle. Um, in some of the later members of this group, uh, probably uh, they either didn't come on land at all or uh, only con came on land in exceptional circumstances. Um, they had uh, like flipper-like limbs, um, they had lost um, all their body armor, uh, whereas uh, in other uh, kind of crocodile line archosaurs, uh, there's often like armor covering the body, uh, whereas a lot of the uh, specialized metrorhynchoids did not, uh, to probably to make their bodies more streamlined. Um, and it has been speculated by some people, although it has not yet been directly confirmed that some metrorhynchoids might have even given live birth to young instead of um, laying eggs, which would make them very unusual um, for archosaurs, because we don't really have any confirmed examples of that in archosaurs. Um, but uh, yeah, looking at their anatomy, they do seem to be highly specialized for a marine lifestyle, um, and so it, it is possible that they found a way to evolve live birth. Um, and so, you know, living this kind of marine lifestyle, uh, basically the researchers who did the study were interested in, like, you know, well, whether they had this kind of integumentary sensory organ to, to go with it, because uh, this kind of uh, sensory system is certainly very useful for modern crocodilians in navigating aquatic environments. And so they did um, basically what they did with the modern crocodilian skulls. They CT scanned uh, the material they had of, like, metrorhynchoid skulls, and then looked at what their... Um, uh, neurovascular canals in the snout looked like. And what they found was that, uh, similar to modern crocodilians, um, early metrorhynchoids um, also had like these three parallel um, canals running through the snout, um, so it is likely that this particular feature is ancestral um, to the group uniting both uh, crocodilians and metrorhynchoids. Um, however, um, in later uh, metrorhynchoids, uh, there are only two parallel uh, canals in the snout, um, and that is pictured on the right here. Because because of the quality of the fossil, I guess the the uh, canals themselves are not particularly complete. Um, however, um, it turns out that in later metrorhynchoids, uh, there is only the um, DAC, the dorsal alveolar canal, and the equivalent to the CPA that run parallel to each other. Um, However, the equivalent to the CIS canal uh, in the later metrorhynchoids uh, does not uh, run parallel to the other two, but instead passes through the tooth sockets, which is kind of weird, and um, it is not known what the significance of this is. Um, so that's something that will require more study to figure out, but it suggests that there was some kind of shift involved um, in this feature as the metrorhynchoids became more specialized for marine lifestyle. And as for the possibility of having integumentary sensory organs, it turns out that metrorhynchoids did not have this kind of really complex branching pattern um, that is seen in the modern crocodilians. Um, and furthermore, uh, the texture on the bones of their snout uh, does not have the really kind of pitted uh, texture with a uh, densely marked um, with pits that is seen in modern crocodilians. So the researchers conclude that it is most likely that metrorhynchoids did not have uh, these integumentary sensory organs, and maybe they relied perhaps more on their eyesight to hunt um, in their um, aquatic environments, which is uh, somewhat different from modern crocodilians, because modern mm. crocodilians do have you know, they have fairly good eyesight, they have decent eyesight, um, but uh, they don't have a, a whole lot of specializations for actually seeing underwater. Um, and furthermore, it has been suggested that modern crocodilians, um, similar to uh, mammals actually, might have passed through a sort of nocturnal phase in their evolution, and so they might have, um, like our ancestors, uh, lost color vision and then had to get it back. Um, so yeah, that is a, that's pretty unusual. And so crocodilian, the ancestors of crocodilians um, might have gone through this phase 
where they relied less on their eyesight and so in turn evolved this kind of integumentary uh, sensory um, organ system to help them hunt underwater, whereas metrorhynchoids never went through that phase and so they probably continued to use their eyesight um, underwater as they hunted and did not need this kind of integumentary sensory organ system. So yeah, that is a, that's a really interesting finding. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the researchers mentioned that um, regarding kind of the uh, the reason why the um, the CIS canal uh, is does not run parallel to the other two in the later metrorhynchoids, um, that uh, we also have to consider not just um, kind of sensory um, related explanations um, like related to the nervous system, but also. Um, possibly uh, vas the vascular system as well, because remember these are neurovascular canals, like they contain both um, nerves and blood vessels. So it might be something about the blood vessels um, that might be uh, related to, to this change. And um, I might as well add here that this is actually one of the reasons that some um, specialists in um, archosaur soft tissues are actually skeptical of um, some of the recent claims that uh, integumentary sensory organs are found in Mesozoic theropods. Um, so I, I know um, a lot of their work um, still has not been published yet, so uh, um, we're still awaiting many of the details, but many of the, the general gist that I've seen from conference presentations and also comments on social media um, by some specialists in um, archosaur soft tissues is that um, a lot of the studies that have claimed that have found evidence for integumentary sensory organs in theropod dinosaurs, um, they only consider the possibility that um, these, uh, that some of the complex uh, neurovascular canals that they're observing contain nerves. And so they, they assume that, oh, okay, so this has to do with like facial sensation. But the thing is that these canals also contain blood vessels and it can be very difficult to tell from fossils, like what, what the proportion of uh, blood vessels versus nerves in is in those canals in a living animal. Um, and so uh, basically other alternative explanations need to be considered uh, before we can really be, be sure about some of those inferences. Um, but certainly uh, in the case of the, this uh, metrorhynchoid paper, um, this does seem to uh, shed some light on how um, these, uh, these systems were different between metrorhynchoids and the modern crocodilians. And so, yeah, um, congrats to Charlotte for a fantastic paper. Um, yeah, I wish uh, my first paper looked this good. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great study. So, uh, yeah, really cool stuff. What do you think? No, I definitely agree. Big congrats. Um, really kind of goes to show, like, how derived some animals can be when mm -hmm. they enter new environments. I right. Mean, the little that I know about metriorhynchoids is like they, I mean, we're used to like a saltwater crocodile being like, oh, this is the crocodilian that goes out into the ocean and right. swims around. But like that's that's peanuts compared to what these guys were doing. <laughs> right. Some of them had like fins on their tails. Mm -hmm. and yep. They were, they were deep diving and it, like it's certainly like it's it's just it's incredible to see like this kind of research done. I mean, I. I'm a sucker for the sort of CT scan, like <laughs> go into the skull, look at the brain, look at the nerves mm -hmm. and, and, and get some new insights that way. Um, it really goes to show like how far paleontology has come as a science. Yep. You, know, you, you don't have to break open skulls to do this kind of stuff. You can You're just right. put it in a CT scan and, and, and it's safe and everyone's happy. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. What a fascinating paper. Um, Wow. So, well, that's another thing to think about too. Like you had mentioned speculation about live birthing. Mm, yeah. That's the runcoids. Yeah. Uh, I don't suppose it'd be too, too far fetched. Um, I mean, I know we're talking about apples and oranges regarding things like lapidosaurs and archosaurs. Yeah. I mean, and like lizards and snakes, like there's all kinds of species that give live birth. Yep. And, um, to my knowledge, like there are no turtles or crocodilians today that no. undergo that process so mm. i mean i i personally wouldn't be too too surprised i guess it all depends on how a how how easily they're able to get around on land if they're in a situation like that because right I, I know for the longest time like plesiosaurs which are um in their own kind of group mm -hmm. you know they were thought to be like you know oh they they're like seals like they right. call themselves up on land and they probably you know laid eggs in the sand like turtles mm -hmm. and went back to the ocean and 
then it's like, oh, we, we find out that these things are giving live birth and they probably couldn't really support their weight like really well on land like a seal does. And um, so like, I I guess, yeah, I guess it really all depends because um, metriorhynchoids, I mean, I'm, I'm only familiar with like, a, I guess the popular species, metriorhynchus yeah. itself. Um, like it had like fairly well-developed limbs, I'm sure, right? Like it, it I know they were probably webbed, but like they, if they were on land, like they could probably shuffle about at least, right? They, they were, the limbs were pretty um, flipper-like. Um, like, I think, I think if they if they came on land, like maybe they could move around a bit, but it would have been very inefficient. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so that that really kind of shows the. The, the close dependence on the marine niche in mm -hmm. that case then um wow all right yeah i mean oh my gosh i i, I know this is got a little bit of a tangent but i think it would be that would be a, a wonderful find if we found like a, a metriorhynchoid with a little baby in it like uh like we found phrygiosaurs before um th th those are incredible fossils of course um no fantastic paper this is really really amazing stuff yeah i certainly agree there <laughs> <laughs> all right uh well i think that's all the stories we prepared for this month um so i hope everybody enjoyed um if you like our work uh, please consider supporting us on patreon um you know <laughs> as, as we always say uh, your contributions will help us continue the series and develop um, additional uh, projects related uh, to it um, as we are uh, currently working on um right now um so yes uh please do consider supporting us if you can and want to um and uh at the moment uh we have one uh, patron i believe uh, who is uh, scheduled for a shout out in each episode and that is a uh, joan's sister julie and so thank you very much your support is greatly appreciated um and uh as usual, we have acknowledgments for our friends. Uh, Henry uh, prepared our wonderful theme music, and um, Alicia um, came up with the color scheme for my avatar. So uh, thanks a lot, as always. And uh, if you want to uh, follow our work, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, where we always uh, tweet when we uh, release new episodes. Uh, you are probably on our YouTube page right now, so uh, please subscribe if you enjoy our work and want to keep following us. Um, that's a good way to do so. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to leave a comment um, in the you know, YouTube uh, comment section or send them to our email at timingclades at gmail.com. Um, and you can see the description for links to you know all the uh, websites and studies that we talked about um, in this episode. Now, um, in terms of uh, what our next episode is going to be, um, so, uh, I still need to uh, do an updates episode for Dinosaurs the Second Chapter, so my series mm -hmm. on the evolution of birds. Um, I'm thinking it probably won't be released next week, because uh, my plate is pretty full and I'm going to need time for that. But I'm, I'm going to say that when we, um, whenever we decide to record the next episode, I think that's probably going to be the next thing we do. So, yeah, uh, look forward to that. And... Um, Otherwise, um, hope you enjoyed the show and take care, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Have a great day.